Stanford University. Hacking Consciousness, session number eight. Really delighted to see everyone here today. And it's uh, quite an honor to basically welcome our wonderful guest, Dr. Pamela Peake. Thank you so much for making the track here, despite um, sort of all that's going on in her life, very busy life. So please uh, welcome her and give her a round of applause before I give her bio. Thank you so much. No, no, no. Thank you. So quick logistics thing. If you're taking the class for a unit, the code today is health. And speaking about health, it's a big personal, uh, um, basically, uh, what is that called? Passion. That's right. That's what I was looking for. It's a big personal passion of mine. In fact, it's so much so of a passion that I've started a company around it. The company is called Oh My Green. We provide taste-tested healthy snacks to companies. And the reason why I started it is I always looked at what I've been complaining the most about. And I realized that ever since I moved to this country, I complained about food the most. And I realized that I grew up with an amazing now 80-year-old grandma in Berlin, Germany, that is a medical, retired medical doctor. And for more than 30 years, she's actually tended to an organic garden. And whenever I would come over to her house, she'd pick fruits and vegetables from the garden, should tell me about the difference between a Gravenstein apple or a Fiji apple, take those fruits and vegetables, bring it into her kitchen, and then cook with them. And then the family would bond around the dinner table. And at that dinner table, she would always tell me, what you put into your body directly affects your health and your well-being. And that message really stuck with me. And I couldn't just eat any sort of processed food. You know, when you go into a regular supermarket, a lot of the stuff that you eat there is highly processed. It's injected with you know, pesticides. It has genetically modified organisms in it. And that whole realization made me want to start this company, essentially. So Dr. Pamela Peake is going to talk to you about health today. And she has quite an amazing bio. So I thought I'd do something a little bit differently. Instead of just giving you the highlights, I thought I'd actually read something for you. So you get a bit more of a flavor of where she's coming from. All right, here it goes. Dr. Pamela Peake is an internationally renowned physician, scientist, and expert in the fields of nutrition and fitness. And Dr. Peake is a Pew Foundation scholar in nutrition and metabol metabolism, assistant clinical professor of medicine at the University of Maryland, and fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American College of Sports Medicine. While a senior research fellow at the NIH, Dr. Peake was the recipient of the National Health Research Science Fellowship an intramural research training award where she helped identify the relationship between chronic stress and intra-abdominal fat. Dr. Peak is a senior editor for the women's health section of the newest edition of the Lifestyle Medicine textbook. Dr. Peak has teamed with the U.S. Surgeon General to create the Surgeon General Walks for a Healthy and Fit Nation. She's a member of the Maryland Governor's Council on Fitness and is national spokesperson for the American College of Sports Medicine's Exercise is Medicine Global Campaign. Dr. Peake is a regular in-studio medical com commentator for the national networks and is a monthly columnist and contributing editor for numerous national magazines, including Prevention and Fitness. Dr. Peake is a chief lifestyle expert for WebMD's 90 million members and is chief medical correspondent for Discovery Health TV, where she is featured in the award-winning National Body Challenge, ser Challenge Series, as well as her Could You Survive? Dr. Peak, a New York Times bestseller, best-selling author, including her latest book, The Hunger Fix, um, which was recently launched on the Katie Couric Show, and which is the first consumer book describing the science of food and addiction. Dr. Peak is senior science advisor to Elements Behavioral Health, one of the country's largest addiction and eating disorder treatment centers, where she is creating the first programs to tackle addictive eating behaviors. Finally, Dr. Peake was just named to the board of the National Senior Olympics and will be a competitor in the triathlon in 2015. Quite the bio. So please welcome Dr. Pamela Peake. I have to fess up right away. I have three degrees from Berkeley, and I just uh, got through uh, coming back from Berkeley uh, over the weekend where my niece just graduated. So there it is. But you guys are OK, too. <laughs> kind of. So there it is. I'd like to know a little bit about who's in the class, if you don't mind. So I'd like to 
If you could um, look up from your computers and uh, just tell me if you're an undergrad. Any undergrads? Cool. Why are you taking this course if you're an undergrad? Just throw it out. Why is this, why'd you sign up for it? Go. Cool. Cool. All right. What's your major? Computer science. Boy, let's see now. Computer science consciousness. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. We used to say it was a stretch, but now we're we're seeing that it's not anymore. How about you back there? Cool. And what's your major? Hmm? I lasted one semester in philosophy, man. If they ask me why one more time, <laughs> like, please, I just, you know, can we just move on? Okay. Excellent. Wow. How about? I would also like to present a topic for like, I read a lot of books about like the history of the colony, so like, more like, as like, I was reading about like those kind of stuff, like, Cool. Awesome. You know, there's a huge component um, that we're, that's, that's expanding uh, in the field of uh, psychology for sure. There's absolutely no question. How many of you know what the word epigenetics stands for? You will when you blast out of here today. And um, that will be a huge gift to you because it's going to be literally the wave of the future. I'm an NIH-based scientist, and um, you've heard of the, um, the Genome Project, you know? Um, and this is where we kind of do the laundry list of genes, and that turned out to be the biggest bore on the planet, but, you know, whatever. We now know where all the genes are. Then the next question was, so who cares? Um, and uh, this is where we stumbled upon probably the biggest thing in science, um, especially as it's going to be applied to what we do here, um, for this century. And when you leave here, your mind will be definitely blown. I come in with, you know, armed and uh, dangerous, locked and loaded with science, um, and I like to be able to translate it enough so you can have a little bit of fun with it. And when applying it to this arena, we, we, you, you'll see that there's some tremendous potential for its personal application to you as well as what you're going to be doing in your own um, hemispheres of, of study. Now, if you're not an undergraduate, are there any graduates in here? Okay, why, way in the back, why are you doing it? What do you care? I think it's interesting that um, you're going to approach spirituality, uh, consciousness from spirituality with scientific sort of way, and it's interesting to see actually what links there are and uh, how the scientific community is looking at it. Cool. How about you? You're studying business. So this seems like something totally different. Um, but I, I studied science in undergrad, and so I like the more scientific lens that I can relate to. You have no idea how powerful the relationship is between what you're going to be, what you have been learning about, and what you're going to learn about today to business. It's very, very profound. You'll see. All right? How about you? Me? He's <laughs> <laughs> We've been there. I'm not actually taking it for credit. Yeah, as a business student, um, I'm going to move my career into a graduate course. So I'm interested in consciousness, meditation. Very good. To make people more effective, more happy. So he's really interested in something called executive coaching. Um, I'm on faculty um, at the Harvard Institute of Coaching, and what we do is, you know, we're looking at all of these issues as they apply to every level of coaching, whether it's executive wellness, which is one of the biggest new sectors, or otherwise. And so that obviously has, you know, great application. If you're not a graduate student or an undergrad, so what the hell are you? What are you left? You have community people? 
And so who's from the community? All right, very nice. All right, why are you interested? Uh, my background is actually in nutritional science and health fields. Um, I, I grew up in Seattle. Um. <laughs> Go Bears. Um, so sorry, I had to say it once. Cool. Absolutely. <laughs> um, not working for a while, I had both the um, advantage and curse of uh, reflecting about, in this case, um, all the questions that I think belong forever, existential. So, so, so you have a chance to be able to kind of delve into it a little bit more. Mm hmm And you go from the neurological correlates. Right. Cool. Cool. How many of you meditate? If you don't, that's chill. I didn't meditate till five years ago. Um, I'm a quintuple A personality, and it, you know, it, it took a, <laughs> it took a, a village um, to uh, get me going on this, um, which I'll explain. But uh, one of the things you're going to find is that. Uh, it's probably one of the most powerful ways to be able to power up the most important piece of your brain. I don't care what you're studying, whether it's business, it's computer sci or the rest of it. You can't do anything without a powerful prefrontal cortex. And it's right behind your forehead. And the grand majority of people, especially in neuroscience, had no clue as to the power of what was going on there until seriously the last six years. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about is, is kind of ramping you up to speed here so that you understand how all of this sort of interconnects one way or the other. Why are you here? Um, just explore, explore new ground. Cool. Good. Um, be a student of life. It's one of the most important things you'll ever do. And I want to thank uh, my wonderful host um, and the person who put this uh, class together. Um, I will tell you that uh, you're ahead of Berkeley on this one, and that's so bizarre, um, because I thought Berkeley for sure would, you know, whatever. But we're going to get you over to the, the other campus um, in no time at all. I'm, I actually am going to be using this new science that I'm going to be describing um, as an example of how you apply uh, the, what I'm going to be describing. And what I like to do is do a little bit of interactional thing too. Um, I, I don't like to pontificate. Uh, I like to have some fun um, when we're doing this. And, you know, for years and years, uh, I've been watching my patients in clinical trials and also uh, in my own uh, practice uh, sound like a bunch of little druggies. Uh, they would say, gosh, I need a hit. Withdrawals, hell. Um, where's my fix? And I thought, geez, I got a bunch of cokeheads in here. And it turns out they were talking about cupcakes, pizza. And I thought, oh man, this can't be real. Um, and this is before we really had, you know, the hot science now that we do. But you know, most of us as, as national experts would sort of quietly, you know, hide in a corner somewhere at annual meetings where no one could hear us and look at each other, going, is there really something to this? And finally, um, we have a hero, and that turns out to be one of the most brilliant scientists on this planet, and that's Dr. Nora Volkall, who is the director of the National Institute of uh, uh, Drug Abuse of the NIH. And it was she who actually broke the code um, in the early 2000s, and then we started building up more and more data to find out that it wasn't just about certain funky foods that were doing this to our brains. It was about the fact that we just plain live addictive lifestyles. Feel a little hooked, do you? I did a, I'm a TED pre presenter, and I did a TEDx um, uh, for Wall Street uh, this past October uh, at the New York Stock Exchange. And there I was uh, faced with 500, you know, hedge fund founders and all the rest of it in this rather interesting ballroom looking thing. And uh, it was amazing, because um, <laughs> I was staying down on Wall Street uh, for the event, and there's a bar every 20 feet. 
And, but it's a really nice bar. You know, it's like wood carved and really expensive and gorgeous looking and in boutique hotels and back. But there's a bar every 20 feet. And uh, many, many of these guys and gals, mostly guys, you know, uh, didn't realize the kind of life they were living. Um, when I finished my, my TED, it was very interesting. I was like, you know, besieged by all these, you know, happy campers. And one of them walked up to me and says, well, I'm down off cigarettes. I was doing the three packs a day. He says, I'm off them. I'm off them. He says, I'm off alcohol, too. That was a bitch. He says, but you know... Now that I've heard what you said, he said, I, you think it's really unusual to start your day in the shower with a full-on Coke? In the shower? He just keeps a bottle there. I mean, why waste time? And then he goes and he does two six-packs a day. And what he did was he transfer addicted. He says, but it's just Coke, really? Can you say Science Fair Project? And, you know, I'm not one of these demonizers. I just give you the facts, you know. You're the ones who make the decisions. Science fair project or natural food, your choice. It's also another thing I told him. I said, well, you know, it's time you weaned yourself off this stuff. He says, monsters and, and, and Red Bull won't work either. I said, really, seriously? <laughs> Read the label. If it looks like jet fuel, it is. Get it? And he was a riot. He was very good. Um, so what I'm going to describe are some sort of interesting things. I use this whole issue of food and addiction because I want you to understand why the 11th, when, when you have that, um, the 12th step uh, for addiction in general, which was written back in the 1930s, number 11 was meditation. And um, this is long before we had fancy schmancy uh, PET scans and stuff that you're going to see. They just sort of said, I don't know, it, it sounds like a good idea. I feel pretty good, and I feel like I can rein in all these bad boys every time I do meditation. It was sort of a generic meditation. Well, now we're going to understand a little bit more about why that's happening. So we're going to blend food addiction science. We're going to blend in um, epigenetics, and we're going to try to put all of this together as you walk away saying, damn, that's interesting. How about we listen to what addiction sounds like. I'm negative and I'm dark. And I want to do bad stuff. I want, I want to hang out in this neighborhood alone. That thing is hanging out in this neighborhood alone up here. Right? I want to kill everything. I want to kill me too. I want to live my solo life. I don't want to die. I'm on the verge of dying because I'm a vicious alcoholic. And I've been, I've been, um, wow. I've been, um, now this is kind of interesting stuff. I've been, um, I had to drink uh, two drugs in six days. And for me, that's a miracle. I've been lying to everybody else and saying, I'm sober. I'm not. It's not six days. I'm not going to use again. That was back in September. And uh, in September, um, he also um, was finishing his book, which, which came out. And uh, he's still clean, um, which is a, a huge miracle. But I wanted you to hear the pain that went behind that. And I find it absolutely fascinating that he kept banging on his prefrontal cortex. So, oh, I was trying to kill me. No, it's, it's what you're going to find is it's grossly impaired. And the reason why I am hankering on the prefrontal cortex is because guess what happens when you meditate? I'm not telling you yet. So... Now we have a lot of voices um, joining us, of course. Um, scientists now who have made it exceptionally clear that um, there's something up with all of this. Well, we'll of course, Michael Pollan over here from UC Berkeley. Um, I'm, I, I didn't, come on. You may wrote the omnivore's dilemma and all the rest of it. And of course, you know, we have um, Ludwig um, from Harvard and, and Lustig from UC San Francisco. And these are the, the sugar guys, um, which we'll get to. Dave Kessler is my dear friend. Um, when I wrote The Hunger Fix, which is um, the consumer book on this, um, Dave was quoted in that from his original book, um, The End of Overeating, obviously a joke. But um, he was one of the first people as a, as a former FDA commissioner to really say, you know, I don't know, there are certain foods, it's not apples, um, that seem to kind of get people 
into these addictive-like behaviors. What's that about? And of course, Dr. Volkol um, from the NIH, um, Dr. Gold, University of Florida, Jean Jack Wang, there's a mother who couldn't decide, so his name is Jean Jack Wang. Um, and probably one of the most brilliant um, scientists in the field is Nora's uh, right-hand guy, um, Nicole Avina from uh, uh, Columbia, and of course, um, Kelly Brownell um, is one of the big pu public policy guys on this, saying, if this is all true, we're all in trouble. There's a movie that's out now. If you've seen it, um, you should. Um, this, this really pretty much describes every, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about, but takes it into a very personal level. It literally just came out. Um, it's a documentary, um, and it's uh, uh, open in, in I, I would say, the grand majority of the big cities. It just opened up about two weeks ago or so. Um, and so that's a little heads up. Now all of a sudden we've got books upon books coming out. This is probably one of the best ones. I'm um, just looking at the industry. And this is Michael Moss, the Pulitzer Prize winner, blew the top off um, what happened in the meat industry. He decided to go after salt, sugar, and fat and um, discovered really amazing things like they're playing with you. There's something called the bliss point. Do you ever notice how, you know, um, we've all sort of blasted through bags of Cheetos and all the rest of it, that they melt in your mouth and they really hit your brain quick? Um, they do that for a reason. And um, multiple millions have been spent on the research that it takes to be able to hit the bliss point in your brain, which you'll see, um, as quickly as possible so you'll want more. Um, and so uh, he was the one to describe the politics of what happened behind that. Um, uh, delightfully, um, when my book came out, um, right a, a month prior to that, sometimes there is a God, um, the textbook came out. This is 66 chapters meant for the professionals, not a consumer book, um, on everything from clinical studies to basic studies and all the rest of it. It's really hot. Um, and it has, for all intent and purposes, some of the most um, bleeding edge research in the field, really linking um, the relationship between certain uh, food like products and addiction, and obviously um, the work done by Lustig on, um, on sugar. We even have you know, celebrities kind of kicking it in there uh, back and forth. We have more and more of this going on. But here was something that I thought was really quite fascinating. I was at a meeting, it's called Way to the Nation. We have it every two years in Washington, D.C. And at that time, Secretary Sebelius um, was attending and uh, as one of the keynoters. And then she said something, and I think I dropped my iPad in, um, when she said it, because I had no idea she was going to say it. Any combination of factors. For some, it's an addiction like smoking. For others, it's a lack of fresh fruit. Say what? Vegetables near their home. And the point is, we need to meet people where they are and use every tool that we have. So for the first time in history, um, a government official at, at that level any government official actually said uh, the word addiction in association with food, at which point in time the food industry, you know, had a seizure, um, is saying, you know, we're in trouble now. And there you have it. But it's kind of fascinating. It's like, wow, it's, it's made it all the way to the top. Uh, do a lot of people think that there's uh, something addictive about all of this? Absolutely. Globally, 80% of people believe that um, uh, sugar is addictive. Um, and this is refined sugar. Everyone had that feeling. Does it affect everyone? Of course not. Um, does everyone meet criteria for a serious problem with food and No. Nah. Grand majority of the people are on the launch pad, but they, they don't meet criteria. Um, but people really believe inherently there's a little issue here. And of course, we now have all kinds of you know, groups showing up. And what's also interesting is we're finding out something quite fascinating. Um, uh, there was an article that literally just came out, I'm not kidding you, it just came out um, uh, within the last seven days. So get this, and this is um, Ludwig's work at Harvard. And what he actually said was this, he said, I think I figured something out. And this is the way it goes. And I'm a, you should know I'm a fat cell um, uh, physiologist. This is what I did most of my, my, my work with. And so I was waiting for someone to finally get this and maybe take it national. I think Ludwig may have finally uh, added that little piece of the puzzle. Here's what he said. He said, look, here, every single fat cell, it looks like a little soap bubble, 
If you go to my Facebook, you can see all of this. Just go to Dr. Pam Peek, um, because I've uh, made it very clear there with some very pretty pictures and all the rest of it. So every fat cell has an entryway and an exit way. Right? And it's controlled by a separate enzyme. So you're either storing it or you're releasing it. I mean, really, that's kind of what fat cells do. They sit there, they store, they release, and they have a nice day. Now, when you have refined sugars specifically, they jack up insulin. Insulin, mind your insulin. This is what the article was about. When you jack up insulin, what do you do? This is quite fascinating. What you do is you turn on fat storage and completely turn off fat release. Now, as a survival mechanism, it's perfectly fine. But, when, but can you imagine for a moment if you're just sort of zipping through the day, constantly grazing on refined sugar, and it's just sort of everywhere, you know, you're picking at it and messing around. What did you just do to that fat cell? You kept it turned off from fat release. So honey, you could exercise all you want to. Oh, you'll get a little bit of fuel out of there, but nowhere near as much if you weren't grazing on refined sugar. So we just figured out why so many people are so, you know, just so frustrated. They go to the gym and they pay through the nose and they're mm, like this and they go home and they have more refined sugar and they're still not dropping weight. That's because all your fat cells are locked up. You just lock them up. And we, we saw this many years ago, but now we finally put all the pieces together. And, and this is just a huge piece. And you could Google this in the New York Times. This was a uh, big piece in the, um, the op-ed section. It's called, Why Are We Always So Hungry? And the joke is, why should you be so hungry when you have all this excess fat on your body? You just use it, but you can't. You locked it up. So it's sort of fascinating how the whole thing is beginning to come together. And, you know, it's obviously these ultra-processed, refined, manufactured foods that are getting us into trouble. Now, why is that so? Why don't we just sort of become blueberry heads, you know, um, doing blueberries? I mean, you know, and, and the reason why that doesn't work is because, yeah, they're rewarding. There's a reward center in your brain. Now we're gonna be getting into this whole consciousness and going into the neuroscience way. There's a reward center in your brain. It's very important. Now, there's two reasons why you and I are here today. Just two, sex and food. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> now, sex I'm not dealing with. Fifty Shades of Grey took care of that quite nicely. I'm not even gonna go there. Sex, for all intents and purposes, is still sort of the same thing, you know, all these years. All right, if we did not find eating and sex to be rewarding, we wouldn't do it, and then we wouldn't be here. We actually have taken mice, transgenic mice, and we've done a knockout on the genes that basically uh, form pleasure in association with eating. What do the mice do? They just sit there and starve to death. They look at it like a lump of coal. They could care less. It's like, what? If you don't have reward in what you do every day, you do not do it. Now, we have all kinds of weird rewards. Who really loves to brush their teeth? Is that rewarding? No. Sort of. I don't know. It's kind of nice to have a fresh mouth. But on the other hand, I discovered at a very young age that the real reason why I did it is I didn't want to pay a mortgage to a periodontist somewhere. I just wanted to get done with it. So my reward was, was a very different kind of reward. It wasn't necessarily blissful, but I got the message loud and clear. When I, I have two master's degrees from Berkeley um, that I got before I went to medical school. In each case, I had to do you know, statistics and really fun stuff to, you know, to grind it out. Was I finding that particularly rewarding? Eh, no. But I found the master's degree to be rewarding. You see what I'm doing? I'm just sort of coming down the pike here. So I'm putting it all together, action, consequence. So for, you think about it for a moment. From the moment you wake up, every flippin' thing you do is associated with reward. It is. It has to be. Some nuance on reward. So food's got to be rewarding. So let's just say it's a zillion years ago, and I'm out there and I'm foraging and I see the blueberries and I eat them for the first time I have a blueberry and what does my nucleus accumbens do up there in the reward center? 
it lights up like Kyoto at nighttime. Like, yeah, man, this is good. You form a memory. The memory is permanent. So the next time I see blueberries, man, this is good. Let's do that one again. And your brain and your body are in sync. I'll only eat when I'm hungry. Right? And there's not a whole lot. There's not like nine zillion blueberries falling out of the sky. It's just I got to forage. I got to work for these babes. And there it is. All right. So in the reward center of the brain, you have reward, dopamine, the neurotransmitter that's in charge of reward, basically increases up to a certain level. So, wow, blueberries, let's do that. We like blueberries. It's a good thing, right? And then down you go again. And you feel good. It's like, wow, that's pretty good. What happens when you have that birthday cake once a year, you know, where someone's layering all that crap on the top of it, and it's perfectly fine. I mean, birthday cake's cool. It's once a year. Who died? Come on. So you have a piece of it, and all of a sudden, here's the blueberry level. All of a sudden, you're like zipping right up here to the uber level, you know, over the top. Man, this is like super good. And then it comes down again. Now, the brain during this time is a little overstimulated. Whoa, what's she doing? What the hell is she eating? Like a lot of refined whatever and, and, and fats and all this stuff. Who the hell cares? Because you only did it once, and then you bring it back down again. So the brain can handle that. It's like, whoa, a little overstimulated, but I'm good. We're all right. Okay, we're good. What does methamphetamine do? Where do you think, okay, here we are at the blueberry level. I can't even reach that high. How about cocaine? All right. So now we understand why the brain cannot handle consistent and regularized overstimulation like that, be it from chemicals or whatever. It just can't handle it. And it will do something, and you will see, to be able to help you survive. And by doing so, it starts the cycle of addiction. It's really quite fascinating. So when I bring up what kinds of foods may be addicted, well, duh, you know, it's the ultra-processed foods mostly, because most all the natural foods hit you at the blueberry level. That's where they hang out. This is normal. The brain is, oh, yeah, this feels good. Bring it down. We can do this. Bring it down, you know, like this. You just can't keep doing that, right? Because then you're going to get kicked in the face, and you'll see why very shortly, all right? Now, could you overeat and become, as it were, uh, someone who demonstrates addictive-like behaviors with natural food? Sure. How about bread and butter, Right? And a lot of people just sort of plow through loaves, and, and they can't be safe within, you know, 100 yards of, of bread. Okay, I'm good with that. Or it could be anything, but the grand majority of natural products don't do this to you. They just don't. So you take a natural product, like the, the, the cacao, there it is, it's the cocoa, and it becomes cocaine. We've just processed the hell out of it. So if you want to see ultra-processed, there it is. Well, there's ultra-processed too, right? Perfectly normal. And we add a, a few little interesting ingredients. And this is our little friends, right? So we're kind of going from one thing to another. I don't see a whole lot of people, you know, like doing corn in the corner, <laughs> right? But how many Cheetos bags have we plowed through, you know, during finals week? And there's a reason why. And they just love it that you buy as much as you do. It's the bliss point. Next time you see those little things say, someone paid multiple millions to mess with my brain and to hijack my reward center, because that's precisely what they're doing. Oh, I, this is my all-time favorite. There's not a single natural <laughs> ingredient in these things, and they're back again. Jesus, somebody bought Hostess. <laughs> Don't they understand? OK, I'm OK now. I just had to take a breath. There's three kinds of rock in there. There's petroleum. See that white stuff? That's not cream. I don't know what the hell. I think I, it's in a sewage ditch somewhere. I, I, I don't know where they got it from. All I know is when you read the side label, I'm a scientist. I don't even recognize half of that. Okay? And if it looks like jet fuel, it is. And if it doesn't melt in a 1,000-degree oven, that's a bad thing. What is it doing in your intestines? And most of this stuff is getting stored in your fat. Want to hear something really wild? Do you remember the Myanmar disaster, you know, the tsunami? Remember that horrible thing that happened? Do you remember that? Thousands, thousands of people died. 
It was a terrible disaster. A friend of mine, he's a pathologist, you know, is a big volunteer, went out there to help out, you know, to identify bodies. And, you know, I'm part of a whole group that likes to do that a lot, to go out and do some medical something or the other with these things. But he was a pathologist. He came back and said, Pam, I, I just got to tell you, I always know who the people from the civilized societies are out there when we're identifying bodies versus the indigenous populace who eat natural foods. Do you know where I'm going on this? Okay? Because the indigenous populace, they tend to decompose very quickly, na nature to nature, and the others just sit there. Think about that. They're preserved. You get it? That was kind of weird. I couldn't finish my dinner. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. OK. So at the same time, we also don't want a lot of variety. So there's your variety. Just give me one thing. Do you ever notice that? Just like, can, can we keep things simple here? I don't need this. But there it is. And so what does that do? It messes with your brain. It says, whoa, trigger, cue, trigger, cue. One of the things that Dr. Volkhold discovered first on was it was fascinating. When you're finally kind of getting to that place where you feel loss of control around this stuff and back and forth, guess what? When you're really starting to do the addictive-like behaviors, it's not consuming it. That's the Mac Daddy here. It's thinking about it. It's anticipation. We're going to go to a cupcake shop. You know, there you are. And when you actually eat it, it's like, eh, how about another one and another one? So it was the cue that actually did that. We'll see more. And of course, we're cued out everywhere. Everything's called crave. Everything. OK? And then the portion thing. And obviously, we can score food all the time. There's actually a, a spectacularly brilliant scientist on the Stanford campus who I have been following for years and is a colleague. His name is um, Robert Sapolsky. And if you have not read his work, read it. He's spectacular. He's a MacArthur Fellow. And um, his seminal uh, work, which I just, I mean, I've read all of this stuff. And he also writes monthly for the Wall Street Journal. Um, he's, a he's just a superb writer, which is really amazing, too, in addition to being a great scientist. It was Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers was his first big bestseller. And he explained the nature, the natural um, form of stress, per se. And uh, it was interesting. He goes into a lot of this issue uh, of how stress itself, once it's ignited, will actually launch a horrendous stress or cortisol-initiated appetite, something that nothing can stop. It's very difficult. So you end up doing this. You start building up over the years um, how much refined sugar you actually take in. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. When all of this was going on, of course, you know, I'm practically pro popping Prozac to get through the science going, geez, this is like a downer, man. <laughs> it's just like, how do we get ourselves out of this mess? We've been at this for a long time. How do you do that? You see, my, my reward center has been hijacked. Um, my prefrontal cortex, which you'll see, um, is now impaired. It actually is organically impaired. The reward center is organically altered. How, how do we undo all this? And just when we were, you know, ripping out our hair and thinking, well, a very strange thing happened. And it was an extraordinary thing to save the day. And that was the birth of something called epigenetics. Now, I was weaned on DNA as destiny, right? You've heard that. DNA's destiny. Well, to a certain degree it is, but I can mess with you. So I'm five foot nine, right? I, I, I got good nutrition as I was growing up and, you know, all the usual supportive stuff. So my family is very tall, right? And um, my uh, baby brother is six foot seven, to give you a small clue. So my genes were all going to the tall place. What if, however, I was born in Romania? 20 years ago, when they took kids and basically slapped them in orphanages and they abandoned them. Do you think I'd be five foot nine? I don't think so. 
And how did that happen? I should have been five foot nine. My DNA was all about five foot nine. Well, as it turns out, now we understood what happened. And now you will too. Because you see, DNA is not destiny anymore. Only in very, in a small number of cases is it, and those are life-threatening diseases for which we still do not know how to deal with, Tay-Sachs and others that we're, that we're born with. But outside of that, we can mess with you. These are fat cells from my lab. These are actually mouse fat cells. And what you see here is you see the cell wall, all lipids, beautiful lipids. And you actually see the nucleus, and it's dividing already. It's kind of neat. And what we began to realize was, wait a minute now, what's controlling all of this? these divisions, the ability to be able to change the very presence of X number of fat cells, the ability to control the percentage of fat cells. Can we mess with this somehow? Well, one of the things you learn about science is that all great science, especially amazing science, that changes the world actually occurs by sheer serendipity. You know, penicillin, wow, what's that stuff growing off on this auger plate? Hmm, smells weird. Okay, that's how it all started. Same thing happened in the laboratory of Dr. Randy Jurdel. Randy was, it was, was at Duke University at the time, and he was playing around with certain mice. These are agouti mice. These mice were basically condemned from the beginning. In their uh, genome, and we now know how to pinpoint this, um, is the agouti gene. Now this agouti gene um, is, is a gene, when fully activated, will color the mice yellow, it's a biomarker, and they'll be obese, uh, and they will die early from the usual suspects, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. It's kind of a bum life, basically. So what he decided to do was he said, you know, I know where the agouti gene is. I wonder whether or not I can mess with it. He was just sort of doing one of those, I'm bored today, let's mess with it. And he had heard that perhaps a methyl group, CH3, could be used to be like an on and off switch on that gene. Could he actually change the destiny of these mice who generation after generation after generation all look like this and all die early. So he decided to do one thing. He said, I'm going to do something real simple. I'm not going to have them meditate. They're not going to do exercise. Forget all that stuff. I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to take the females, right, and, and the males, and who are going to become, you know, basically parents and pregnant, and I'm going to feed them greens. Now, greens, in case you didn't know it, are absolutely jam-packed with methyl donors. Kale is a big boy. After all my lectures, kale sold out everywhere. Um, but it, <laughs> it's so true. Um, and he just decided, you know, I'm going to throw a bunch of greens in there. And I'm just going to see whether or not it makes any difference. That's all he did. So he gave them, for all intent, folate, B vitamins, the greens. That's what, that's what you get out of greens. And then he just decided, okay, fine. And then the good news is the gestation period is only nine days or so. And so they waited around because scientists have no personal life. We just sit around waiting for mice to have babies. I mean, this is kind of where it goes. It's pathetic, but it works. Great science. And one Friday night, there he was kind of staring down there at the cage. And the babies were born. That cupcake keeps showing up. I don't know why. It's that crafty assistant of mine keeps doing that to me. And the babies were born. And that's the birth of epigenetics. So when he found this, they were born lean, brown, and lived forever. He thought, now wait a minute, whoa, what's happening here? So he went right into the babies or the pups. Uh, a goody gene, 
knows where to find it, real easy to find. And what do you think he found? That little Hummer was turned off. It was what we call methylated. Whole bunch of methyl groups just, you know, kind of piled on top of that gene and said, uh-uh, we're not doing this anymore. And that was it. Turned it off. Well, needless to say, this was, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. You get the point? This is like really hot new stuff. Ever since then, we now have the Epigenome Project. Remember the Genome Project? So last year, we don't do that anymore. We've already done the genes. Now we have the Epigenome Project. And in this case, what we do is we actually now look at all kinds of what we call loci or collections of genes, and we say to ourselves, I wonder how I can mess with those by doing certain interventions. Here's what we found. In meditation, I'm just going to that for a second because I've just done nutrition here, and I'll get to, I kind of do what I love to call mind, mouth, and muscle. The older you get, the more you alliterate to remember anything. So we're going to go quickly now to the mind place. When you do meditation on a routine basis, in this case it was um, work that was done with very simple um, mindfulness. Um, the, this was the very first group that had done this. And what they found was that um, they look at specific genes. They just choose them, a whole group of genes that have to do with inflammation. Now, inflammation is a bummer in the body because it's the basis of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. I don't know if you know this, but they're all inflammatory diseases. We now understand that. So you don't want to walk around inflamed. This is a bad thing. You want to be anti-inflamed. So they decided to look at those specific loci. And what they did was they had um, people um, who just, you know, controls who basically were just beginning to meditate a little bit. Then they looked at people who had been regular meditators on a routine basis. And they looked specifically at these loci. What do you think they found? Well, duh, you know, they found that the people who've been meditating actually changed gene expression. See, now you're not changing your genes. Okay, your genes are sitting there. They're just sort of sitting there. But they have potential. Republican, Tea Party, Democrat. They're just sitting around going, you know, like, where are we going? Now, some of the genes have a little bit of a tendency. You know, the genes in Texas are going to go to the GOP thing, right? right? The genes in California, a little bit more Democratic. Maybe a lot of Democratic. Depends. Um, but they sit there with potential. Your choices in what you do determine how that gene, therefore, is going to communicate to the rest of the body. So I'll give you an example. If I say, oh, I'm going to grab a Twinkie. I, I keep hammering Twinkies for the obvious reason. So a twi Michael Pollan you know, calls these kinds of things food-like products. I said, Michael, let's just cut to the chase. They're science fair projects. Come on. You know? So we're going to grab a Twinkie. And there are these things called histones, these little proteins that basically just keep hanging out around each gene. And they watch what you do. You want to keep your histones happy. And if they say, oh, man, she's going for the Twinkie, all right, this is not good. So then the message that the gene then gives to the rest of the body is erode immune function, set up allergic reactions, increase inflammation. I grab an apple instead. Thank God she's grabbed it. She's seen the light. All right, so now I'm going to have an apple. And now when I do that, the, I immediately change the sentence again. And that whole expression to the rest of the body is altered. Now it's flooding the body with phytonutrients, plant nutrients, with vitamins, minerals, fresh water from the fruit itself, fiber, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think is going to happen? You know, you, you obviously have a better end to that one. And obviously it's anti-inflammatory at the same time. So all of these things are good. That's how this happens. Do you understand how empowering this is? You understand how powerful this is? This is huge. We used to think we were imprisoned by our own DNA. No, 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 no. Turns out we have a huge say in what happens with our own genetic expression. So I would say, eat your greens, change your genes expression. Okay? 
Not a perfect one, but here we go. All right, let me see if I can get this thing to go. Here we are. Did it go? I have to aim just right. There we go. So this is what it looks like. Here comes a methyl group. It's like, wow, here's an agouti gene. Let's attack this little mother. Okay, we're going to go right in there. We're going to change the conformation. At the same time, soon, 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 as we keep doing this and we keep wrapping that DNA in those genes, ah, the histones come along saying, she chose the apple. We're all happy. Then that helps to repackage that entire gene. And then what you do is you wait for those histones to continue to do that again and again. They did their job. You have a completely different message. Now, I've made this ridiculously simple because it's not just one gene. There are a whole bunch of genes. There's no one addiction gene. There's a whole bunch of them that interact constantly. So here's the new way to look at this. Genetics may load the gun, but epigenetics pulls the trigger. Get it? You see how cool that is? So every single thing you do in terms of your, your choices in lifestyle, that means things from choosing to be able to learn to be more stress resilient, take a moment, et cetera, et cetera, are affecting huge outcomes throughout the body. This isn't a blow off. This isn't some earthy, crunchy moment. This is hardcore science. And we're drilling down to the genes. I mean, how cool is that? Used to before, there were like black boxes all over our body. We just honestly didn't know. Now we do. We're smarty pants. And now what we're doing is we're trying to help you understand how this works. But I must also tell you, there's just one other layer of complexity to this. <laughs> Remember when you said, a long time ago, you said, well, your mother said, you are what you eat. And this is exactly what Michael was saying. You are what you eat. Well, you're right. You know, like I just explained that, didn't, you? didn't I? I mean, I, didn't I just say? You are what you eat, and all that, and that's fine. But you're also what your parents ate. You just saw that with the agoutis. And here's the other part. You are what your grandparents ate. From what we see now, it's at least two generations that are affected. And the only reason why we don't know anymore is because we haven't kept stats. Now, it's cool that the people in Sweden and the Netherlands, but especially Sweden, I don't know why, but they like love to study their population up there. Maybe there's just, you know, long winters, nothing better to do. They just keep stats. I don't know. All I know is some of the best demographic and epidemiologic data comes out of Sweden because they just have studied themselves to death. They've looked at twins and, you know, whole populations, generations. And thank God for that because here's what they found. When there's feast and famine in a particular area, and this was a, a, a very famous study um, of a place called Overkalix in, in Sweden. And what they found was that when there is feasting going on, yes, they, you know, the farms are going great and everyone's eating well and all the rest of it. When that's going on, what do you think's happening with the grandchildren and the children? Think they do well? Now, I want you to, obviously, this is a trick question. So what happens if there's famine? Do you think they do well? Think those kids are living longer because there's famine, living shorter lives because there was famine on the part of their grandparents or their parents? Now, come on now. Crank it up. Okay, say it again. Okay, so during famine... You said the kids and the grandkids would become more resourceful, okay? So when you say resourceful, we're going to go deep, deep into their biology. This isn't just psychology. This is biology because you're absolutely on the right track. Thank you. The kids, which, what's interesting is the kids 
who suffered from famine do not become obese or overweight two generations later. Why? Hello? Thank? Or my undergraduates? Of course. Epigenetics kicked in. What happened is the, the body said, damn, there's no food. Or, Go into famine mode. The metabolic rate plunged to allow them to live and survive. The body is awesome. What's the number one prerogative of the body? Survive. It'll do some funky things to keep you alive. So what did it do? Obviously, the metabolic rates changed. They were able to survive. They did not become um, obese. That's the good news. There's always a, you know, funky news on this. There's a balance. They were also more depressed and more um, inclined to commit suicide. <laughs> so it's kind of like, OK, well, that's interesting. All right. What happens if your, parent, your grandparents and your parents went through feasting? Everything's fine. The farm is just full, and we're all happy, and life is wonderful. What happened to them? They actually did very poorly. They became obese and overweight. They didn't have that inner conditioning for famine. And they basically died from the usual suspects. Um, and that's what feasting does. So feasting without any of the balance. It's kind of a wild parade out there. My feeling is because they only collected data from these two um, uh, generations, that we don't have any other this data. I mean, that data is kind of parsimonious. I'll put money on it that epigenetics has been going on for a hell of a long time. What do you say? It's more than two generations. I'm just doing the science-based part of this. During World War II, there was a part of um, uh, the Netherlands that was cut off by the Nazis. This was to punish the people in the Netherlands um, for having um, helped the Allies. And during that period of time, it was called the Hunger Winter. They cut them off, and they, these people um, uh, were fed only 500 calories. They can only find 500 calories a day. Newsflash, your brain needs four to 600 calories a day just to function. OK? 20,000 people died by whatever count we had. Um, what happened to those people? The same thing, right? Depression was what happened with the children and the grandchildren, the rest of it. What happened with the Holocaust? It was the same thing. So you see it just follows generations. And the body and the mind, the body-mind, which is um, a unified you know, entity, goes through extraordinary changes during this time. So I'm just telling you, this has been going on for a heck of a long time. And you are the sum total of what happened. And you have huge potential to change that as well. So let's go back again. What's epigenetics then? It's every thought, every mouthful, every step changes gene expression and alters your destiny. That cool? You like that? All right. Now let's, let's go into the mind again. So this is a very interesting experiment that just happened in October. And I did a very uh, uh, entertaining um, ABC Nightline on this piece. Um, this is from the University of Connecticut, where they took rats. And um, they decided to use epigenetics, and they went into the reward center of the brain. In the reward center of the brain, they found one gene. That's all they wanted to find, one hot gene, CFOS, C-F-O-S, that we've used a lot. It basically, it ignites when you get reward, right? Go, you all got an A. Mm, CFOS is ignited, right? And that's what we find. So they decided to go ahead and expose them to morphine and to cocaine. And um, what they found was that the CFOS obviously lit up. They like that stuff. Then they decided, just for the hell of it, um, to feed them something that was a processed sweet. And uh, probably knowing that it was going to end up in the media, they chose an Oreo. Now look, between you and me, without Oreos, I never would have made it through Berkeley. Um, so, you know. And, and so does this affect absolutely every person on the planet? No. But this was quite fascinating. So they had the, um, the rats. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you that you can look it up. I'm, I'm not making this up. The rats ripped the cookie apart, went for the filling. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that was missing was the milk. You know what I'm saying here? I mean, if they had the milk, he probably would have figured that part out, too. Take a little mouth and you know, dip it in the. Anyway, so went right for the filling, because they're not idiots. Um, and so. Um, and then they ate this, and what do you think happened to CFOS? OK, so A, here's your first choice. It didn't ignite at the level of morphine and uh, cocaine. Who believes that? All right, so far my lecture is very successful. Number two, 
It, it equaled that of morphine and cocaine. Okay, I got some takers on that. It was greater than morphine or cocaine. It was greater. And that was, that was the reason why it, it, it landed on the news. Now, there's nothing wrong with an Oreo. I mean, if you had an Oreo, no one's going to grow a third arm or something. But as people were plowing through this stuff on a routine basis, we're running into problems. And so what we found was that um, in basic science, um, we have found that refined sugar, just plain old sucrose in the, uh, in the water bottle um, when, it, uh, when rats um, are utilized in this uh, animal-based uh, experiment, that... Refined sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Do you understand what I'm saying here? No, I'm just a scientist. I'm a messenger here. So um, what's going on? How, what, what are we doing here? Does it make everyone go out there and, and develop immediately addictive behaviors? Of course not. But it does to a hell of a lot of people. Why? Because they're overexposed to this stuff on a routine basis. And it's found everywhere. Salad dressing, ketchup, it's a little sneaky thing. And there it is. And that's, that's one of the reasons why um, one of the things we have to do is, is draw upon some innate powers that we have to be able to stay vigilant, present, and to be able to rein in impulsivity when we can. So can people be addicted to this stuff? Absolutely. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you over to where the fun starts. All right? The work that Dr. Volkall did was to show that in the brain itself, in the reward center, things like drugs are simple. You just give a drug, it goes directly to the nucleus accumbens, and it does its thing. Whereas when you have things like food, you have everything, neurotransmitters, hormones, you've got multiple layers of the brain involved, the prefrontal cortex, the smarty pants up there saying, what am I supposed to do with all this? The amygdala, the fight and flight response, the cortisol I just mentioned, and it goes on and on. It's very complex, okay? And it's so complex that what they, just, this is from Volkall's work, that we have these, what we call, layered architectural connecting nests that are combined, they come together and there's all of this going on. This is why we've just discovered of late how terribly complex the issue of reward actually is, especially with regard to food. Drugs are very simple. All right, here we are. I would add, just like someone hooked on heroin or cocaine, Dr. Nora Volko, the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, says it's probably off. Oh. There may be a common act oh. with addiction and the loss of control that occurs with, with compulsive over interest, which in a way is not surprising because our brain did not develop all of these uh, circuits for us to take off. We developed them to ensure that we did behaviors important for survival, like eating. You know what's really cool about her? She's Leon Trotsky's great-granddaughter. So what you just listened to is Russian with a Spanish accent. <laughs> she's, a, she's one of my neighbors in Bethesda, and uh, she's, a, she's absolutely brilliant. Um, she's also, you know, I told you all great science happens for a reason. She's a chocoholic. And she was always fascinated as a psychiatrist with why she was. And this is what really started her on this whole thing. It's always something wild. It really is. So what she basically said was, you know, it makes sense. This reward center, what do we find rewarding? Um, you know, it's so funny. When I think about meditation, many people kind of roll their eyes and they say, ah, uh, you know, it's like a one more thing. And it, where's the reward in it? Well, there's a hell of a lot of reward because one of the first things you're going to find is you change your own gene expression when you do this, when you do something <coughs> transcendent especially. I just tend to love that level of, of meditation. You know, as someone who does a lot of athletics, I used to think that meditation was basically taking the five-mile run. It, that's one form. It's just sort of, you know, I'm out there and I'm kind of zoning out, and that's good. But there's another layer uh, that goes much, much deeper. And my, my little friend who does the business uh, major over here, 
Um, what's really interesting is the grand majority of people who are now leading Fortune 500 companies um, are meditating. And they're meditating because they know that the only way to stay on track, the only way to be able to tap into creativity, organization, strategy at the highest level is to be able to power up your prefrontal cortex as best you can. And anyone who's not doing that is a fool. Let me show you what goes on you know, in two places in the brain. The first place in the brain, as I mentioned to you before, was the um, reward center. This is some of the most beautiful stuff done by Volkol um, in the uh, mid-2000s. And what she did was she took a normal person who does not meet any criteria for addiction. I think there's like three left in the United States, but there it was, the normal person. I kind of overuse our normals here. Um, and then we have someone who's clearly cocaine addicted and someone who meets criteria for food and addiction. Um, we have something called the Yale Food Addiction Scale now. And this has been um, uh, peer reviewed and published uh, by my wonderful uh, colleagues up at the Rudd Center in, at Yale. And what, what Nora did in, with her team was she took a radionucleotide, basically lit up the uh, reward center, where the dopamine, which comes out when you're feeling pleasure and reward, um, is secreted. When dopamine is secreted, that's all special, but it doesn't mean anything unless it links with its receptor. This is true for all neurotransmitters and, 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 and uh, hormones. So no receptor, you can have all the dopamine on the planet. You have a tsunami of dopamine, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, you have to have the receptor. Once you have the receptor on that brain cell or wherever it is, then all of a sudden it links, ah, perfect fit, boom. Now you have all this, ah, pleasure, reward, and there it is. So what we found was that we gave a pleasurable experience like to the normal person, a beautiful sunset, a picture of their grandchildren, I don't know, something, made them all happy. And what we found was that this radionucleotide basically binds the dopamine with its receptor here. And you see all this beautiful red-orange, that's where all the binding is going on. This is one very happy camper. All right, we did the same thing with the cocaine and the, and the person with the food and addiction issue. We basically cued them up, the hit's on its way. You got a line coming. With, with the person with food and addiction, it's whatever their you know, substance of abuse was. And they said, it, it's on its way. And, the, and just the, the anticipation, the cueing, the triggering was all it took. All right, so, but you notice a difference here between normal and these two? These are indistinguishable. And if I put alcoholics here, methamphetamine, gambling, sex addiction, they all look exactly the same. What happened? Because you see, the receptors disappeared. They're gone. What you have left is just a you know, measly couple receptors, and you've got tons of dopamine pouring out, but there's nothing linking. They're not feeling any pleasure. What happened? What happened was very straightforward. What did I tell you about the brain and survival? In the beginning, I told you that if you're overstimulated too long, 24-7 with the hyperpalatables, whatever combinations are sort of getting to you one way or the other, then something starts happening. What happens is the brain says, man, she is overstimulated. Not good for her. We are going to downregulate her receptors so she doesn't get so stimulated. So that's what happens. The dopamine receptors, we call them the D2 receptors, are basically downregulated. Suddenly, instead of a million of them, we have three. And the brain thinks it did a really good thing for you. See, now you're not overstimulated. Well, that means that one glass of wine doesn't cut it anymore. Three bottles. There's no period at the end of the sentence. It's endless. You can never feel satisfaction because you'll never feel that pleasure and reward the way you used to do it. That starts the entire addictive cycle. It doesn't matter what you're on, one way or the other. Anything that has an addictive-like behavior. So there you have it. That's exactly what took place 
Now, here's something else that I want to get to in terms of meditation. And then we'll really drill down to this. Remember how I said smarty pants is up here? Right behind your forehead. Well, this is what this is. This is the forehead area. It's something we call the orbital frontal cortex or the prefrontal cortex. Now, these are what we call glucose metabolism studies. And, you know, the brain works on glucose um, and optimally. And it likes to metabolize glucose. Now, we gave both individuals here something to really think about. Do you want a Porsche or a Lamborghini? What's it going to be? We gave them something they really want to think about, and oh my gosh, and, and they have to crank it up here and think, think, think. We gave them challenging decisions that they had to make that were extremely important to them. And then we measured glucose metabolism. Look what happened with the normal person. They're just sitting there firing it up. That whole prefrontal cortex is thoroughly engaged. Yeah, let me think about that. What happened to Mr. Cocaine over here, which is, this is a metaphor for all addictive. We just happen to use this one, all right? It's like one third ignited. So what's going on here? When you're living that Wall Street kind of you know, life that I had described before with that nice individual who came up and told me about his cigarettes, his alcohol, and his, and his uh, sodas, what you're actually doing is you're not just changing the reward center. What you're also doing at the same time is you're also uh, impairing and damaging the prefrontal cortex. You're impairing and damaging it. I'm going to take this off. There. Um, can you imagine then when people walk up and say, oh, for God's sake, just use a little willpower. <laughs> really? Seriously? You've got a brain that's fried and you're going to use willpower. It's like asking someone to run a 5K on two broken legs. It just doesn't work. This is an excuse? No, it's a, it's a statement of fact. You have impairment. We're all impaired to some degree with our crazy addictive lifestyles until we can kind of come home again to a core and be a heck of a lot more vigilant, paying attention, staying in the present, being much more optimally engaged in our own decision-making. But instead, we kind of knee-jerk it, don't we? And then we, we get hooked into certain cycles. And this is what happens. I give you an extreme form from actual chemical addiction, but I'm going to tell you, we're seeing the same stuff from all of these other addictive behaviors as well. It's only, it, it falls on an array. It's, it's a spectrum of order of magnitude. And so then you say, geez, what do I do with that? Or, you know, how about epigenetics to the rescue? How about we turn things around, which we've done, clearly. And when we do that, we're able to build back our D2 receptors in our reward center. We're able to reverse the damage that has taken place in the prefrontal cortex. And this is really very powerful. How can you do that? Here's a prefrontal cortex getting hammered here. Well, what's very interesting, I'm going to give you um, one very... Uh, fascinating um, uh, meta-analysis that just came out by a researcher, a neuroscientist, his name is Fred Travis. And Travis published this... Um, that's right, I know. I'm doing a little, you know, I'm doing the, uh, the, the pre-show um, to Fred. And um, Fred is a good friend and um, is a wonderful uh, scientist. Uh, published sort of a, a summary of what happens in the brain when you look at multiple forms of meditation. You know, um, you've got the staring at the flame types, you've got which is focused, you have, you know, lots of visual types, there are um, intent, when you're really intent on a specific thought and you stay with it. Um, there is uh, sort of a whole host of what we call mindfulness. Uh, and then there's transcendental meditation as well. TM is actually a source of a lot of um, studies because it is um, very, it's, it's more organized. So as, as a scientist, we can measure it a lot easier because the actual regimen is easier. It's 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And it's fairly straightforward. Um, and 
one of the things he found was that it was only with um, that one form of meditation, which I found quite fascinating, um, that you found as someone was, was entering what we call transcendence in the, in the TM uh, process, that you actually had increased circulation to the prefrontal cortex during what we call the restful alertness phase. Increased prefrontal um, cortex circulation, meaning that you're getting more nutrients. If you don't think that doesn't help the healing process, do think again. Um, and what's interesting is I go back to, you know, the 12 steps in addiction. The 11th step is uh, meditation. And again, written in the 1930s, they had no idea what was going on. They certainly had never done any of these fancy studies. And what we find now is that they were absolutely right. They just, you know, they kind of inferred it from, from everything that they were doing at the time uh, many, many years ago. So what we're looking for here is ways to be able to improve our overall performance every single day using what? Well, here's the bottom line. Mind, mouth, and muscle. Okay, we go back to my three M's again. One, um, it's interesting. You say the brain, oh my gosh, I've got it hammered. And, and, and this isn't just the prefrontal cortex. So many other parts of the brain are interconnected and they're also, you know, have, have uh, been affected by some of our lifestyle choices. By the way, some of them we had no, no, absolutely no control over. One of the most core reasons why people get off track is trauma. Trauma is a monster. And trauma is ubiquitous. When I say trauma, I'm talking about everything from just emotional abandonment as a child to the bad stuff, the really, really bad stuff. Trauma is, is the way you determine it and you perceive it. I'm working now with a, a, probably one of the, the great names in, in the study of trauma, and that's Dr. Christine Courtois, who wrote the, the textbook on trauma, and, and really starting to put together the fact that from the very beginning, think about this for a second, what if while my prefrontal cortex is being formed, and you know it's not finished in its formation and development until well into adolescence, what if I'm seven and something's going on? The trauma of divorce, the trauma of a, of a funky upraising, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Do you think it's therefore having epigenetic changes on the brain at that time? You better know it does in a big, big way. So that's one of the biggest things that we think about. We think, wow, is there, are there ways of turning this around? Well, absolutely, the mind is is plastic. You can consistently make new neural circuitry to supervene over the old neural circuitry. This is neurogenesis. And you do this every single day by your choices, regardless of what has happened in the past, and making certain as best you can, you can be empowered enough to try to control your environments well enough, the people you hang with, your tribal members, Right? Where you live, how you live. Those are very important and empowering choices that you've got. So let's look at that then. So when you do that, you're looking at meditation. You're looking at choosing appropriate ways to live, making that choice, no longer reacting. Viktor Frankl probably had one of the best quotations on the planet. Obviously, if you haven't read Man's Search for Meaning, please. Um, it's just absolutely seminal. Um, Frankel was a Holocaust survivor, survived uh, four camps. He was a physician and a neurologist. And he had a lot of great one-liners from, from his incredible uh, journey. But this was a specific quote that I thought was very profound. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies the power to choose. In that choice lies your growth and freedom. The grand majority of people are not taking full advantage of the space. In that space is your ability to change all of this. If you're consistently reactionary, that's not going to happen. And that's what's really huge here, our ability to do that. 
Who wants a bigger brain? I do, I do. Okay, want to get a bigger brain? Physical activity. I didn't use the E word. No exercise. I said physical activity. Assume the vertical and do it on a routine basis. And you know what you actually do? This was studies that were done um, specifically on people who were 60 or over, just to make a point. And that is you can actually increase the size of specific portions or segments of the brain. In this case, the first study was on the hippocampus, which is in charge of memory and cognition, by upwards of 5% or more, just by doing one thing, walking. You stimulate neurogenesis. It's one of the most powerful ways to do it. You know something? When I was going through medical school, when T-Rex ruled the earth, um, they told us that the brain cells you got were what you got, period, end of story. They were dead wrong, again, okay? Neurogenesis, complete fluke that this was discovered, again, in animal um, research, that we were able to continuously create more neurons, more neural circuits. Now, does this mean the other ones disappear? Heck no, honey, it's called permanent memory. But right now, they may be a scream in your brain. How about they just become a soft whisper? And then the new neural circuits become the major direction here. That's what's called practice, practice, practice. Continue to ritualize, continue to incorporate into your life. Everything from as simple as just assuming the vertical on a routine basis, to eating those greens, change your genes, expression, as well as doing what you can to power up the prefrontal cortex appropriately. And clearly, anything that enhances stress resilience, as well as, um, your ability to draw upon the prefrontal cortex function at its optimal is where we're going. That's your main mission statement, all right? So we've looked at the science of food and addiction and, and how a lot of this was just a beautiful example of how we can begin to play around with, um, with the new science of epigenetics. We've interwoven both of those. There's a really wonderful researcher at the uh, University of North Carolina. Her name is Barbara Friedrichsen. And Dr. Friedrichsen um, conducted some amazing studies. She's known for the positivity ratio. All you have to do is just Google um, positivity ratio, and, you, and your main goal is three to one. And if you think that's easy, it's a bitch. Um, because when you go through all of her questions to be able to, you know, submit on that JavaScript on her positivity ratio uh, website, suddenly you realize, whoa, this isn't looking so good. You know, I guess I'm not as positive as I thought I was. But then you say, well, so what? So I'm not that positive. So, you know, things aren't as wild and crazy as I thought they were. Well, then she did another experiment with a guy whose name is Case, her uh, colleague at UC, UCLA. And this is what they did. They took two groups of people one group of people were people who took really good care of themselves. Not extreme or anything, but, you know, they got up in the morning and they had their, you know, uh, oatmeal and they took their walks and they, and they did their little meditation and they did all these great things were going on. All right? And this is good. These were called the hedonics. And then she took another group that did the same thing. They took good care of themselves. They were really, you know, really on top of their self-care. But they did one other thing. They gave of themselves. They were in service. So they could be philanthropists. They could be people who volunteer like there's no tomorrow. They, but they extended outside who they were. And this is an interesting group. These people were called the eudonics. And then what she did was she applied epigenetics. She said, you know, hmm, I'm going to look at those in inflammation, inflammatory loci again. I'm going to look at those genes. And what she found was so surprising that it actually hit USA Today and all the rest of it because really between you and me, we always say to ourselves, well, I took really good care of myself. I should have an absolutely optimal you know, epigenetic profile and all the rest of it. And indeed, um, a lot of their stuff was great. Cholesterol was good, blood pressure and all the rest of it. But when we looked at their little inflammatory genes, we found out that they were inflamed. They were inflamed not as bad as someone who was just completely out of control, but they were not anti-inflamed optimally. Instead, they were in this, this, this gray zone.
but they were definitely inflamed. She thought, that's ridiculous. How could that be? They're taking good care. Then she looked at the other people who gave of themselves. They were absolutely anti-inflamed. So the message was clear. That it's not just about taking care of moi. It's about the interconnectedness that was being fostered by all of this, that there's a reward in it that was genetic. We didn't know. Why? Because no one had ever looked. So it's exquisitely important to pay attention to that interconnectedness as well. This isn't just about me, as it were. This isn't just a, a self-play. I, I would like to recommend that on a Google alert, aren't I in Silicon Valley? Um, it, on a Google alert on a daily basis, just for grins, you might want to just sort of do this for a while. Just put epigenetics and, and fill in the blank for whatever you're studying or ever, however you're playing. Epigenetics and meditation, epigenetics and depression, epigenetics and eating disorders, epigenetics and addiction. I mean, just keep going. You are, your mind will be blown because the minute the epigenome was created, the National Institutes of Health, all heck broke out. And suddenly, we had money flowing for some of the most cutting-edge research we've ever seen. And this is going to define everything from what we're going to be doing in terms of public policy, right, to how we're going to be making drugs that save lives. I don't know if you know this, but once the epigenome was discovered, we now have cancer drugs that zero in on just one gene. And we're able to silence it to some degree. Our, clearly our goal is to silence it 100% like the agouti. But we're, we're trying to do whatever we possibly can. We were never able to do gene-targeted therapy before until epigenetics reared its head. And now we can. So there's all kinds of fascinating applications, everything from how we, you know, uh, find our own transcendence and bliss in the morning to actual drug therapies. It's all good stuff. So here's to a powerful prefrontal cortex. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Questions? I definitely want to, you know, grab a few here so that I can, uh, you know, dial me up while you've got me for my 6 a.m. flight tomorrow. Go. I have a question. How long is the recovery time for, say, refined sugar? That's a very good question. That's something we're, we're playing with right now. Um, the damage um, uh, that a lot of these hyperpalatables, especially sugar, sugar is the worst of all. This one we know now from all of our research. Um, the problem with answering that question is that it's everywhere. So if I got you off alcohol, I know exactly what I'm doing. No bars, no bottles, we're done. Cocaine, simple, no white stuff, we're done. Sugar, I think it's in the wallpaper, I don't know, it's everywhere. And, and so, <laughs> so to a certain degree, I mean, our exposure to this is it's sneaky stuff. The sugar, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So because of that, what we simply do is we say, as best one can be, as educated and vigilant as possible, read the labels, especially now that the uh, FDA and the rest of them have said that the labels now must have the full breakdown in carbohydrates. No playing around here. Um, and I would just, between you and me, I'd probably just avoid it as best I can. Just, just get it out of there. Does this mean you can't have mom's, you know, special cookie at Christmas time? Of course not. Remember what I said about the brain? I said it just doesn't like to be overstimulated 24-7 by hitting Starbucks and doing the nasty macchiato hoo-ha $15 nasty things. Um, you don't want to know how much sugar's in that stuff. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, people just do that all day long, like our little Wall Streeter with 12 of them, right? Just eh, constant drip. Might as well put an IV in for all you're getting out of it. You see what I'm saying? So, but it's really, really important to try to do the best you can to eliminate it. And if it turns out to be a food product 
It could be mom's cookies, it could be anything. But a, a food product, no matter how innocent looking, for which the following occurs, then it's not a good thing to be re-exposed to. Okay, you ready? I just did an, an interview with a major magazine about this this morning, and, and it just sort of reminded me all over again about how this works. All right. So I said I went, you know, and I had a biscotti, you know, with um, um, coffee last week. I was at Pete's um, at Berkeley, of course. Um, <laughs> did that happen again? It just keeps coming up. And, uh, and I just had a hankering for one. I thought, oh, what the hell? And I had hiked for five miles that morning, you know, with my niece and, and my family. We, you know, we like to go up to behind Lawrence Rad Lab and around there, just have some fun. So I was feeling, okay, I could do that. I, I was in balance. I was feeling really good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was just not that big of a sky. It was like that. Had a skim latte with it, and I'm, I'm good. What I did not experience was the following. I did not experience a sensation of loss of control. I did not experience shame, blame, and guilt. If all of those things had happened, I'm addicted. You see the differentiator here? Okay, so if I just have my little, you know, I just had a little biscotti a little earlier, it's like, yeah, so who died? You know, it tasted good, I'm done. You know, it's a little treat, been a long day. I don't even know what city I'm in right now, but you know, there it is. I had a good time, but no loss of control, no shame, blame, and guilt. Like, oh, I can't believe I just did that, you know. And then there, when I say loss of control, it just starts into a whole binge cycle, okay? So that identifies addiction. So when I say re-exposure, you have to, you know yourself better than anyone. If that happens, oh, well, we just did our own self-experiment, and we know that that's not going to work for us. Okay, I will tell you, the more you stay centered mentally, the more you check in with yourself. You know, it's interesting. When I describe meditation to people, um, it's, it's fascinating. Many times I usually get the rolling of the eyes, the glazed look, and they run out for the exit door. Um, I used to do the same thing all the time until I became a smarty pants. Um, but one of the things I do now is I say, hey, do you check in with your, your best friend? Oh, sure. Do you check in with, I mean, if you're married or, or you have a partner or whatever, do you check in with that person? Sure. Do you check in with yourself? How about nada? How about you just sort of gloss over it? And you just sort of buzz through the day. And so then I got your attention. Because you have to check in with yourself. I mean, if you're doing it with everyone else, what? How about yourself? And you could do it a multitude of different ways. But you got to check in with yourself. And there are a lot of ways to do it. I like to kind of go to the deepest level. All right, so I got to tell you my story. I couldn't meditate to save my life. I'm just too high energy. I could light up a small city. I just couldn't do it. I mean, it's hard. Um, Herb Benson, the great cardiologist and founder of the Harvard Mind Body Institute, is one of my dearest friends. He's now emeritus. And he tried to get me to do the relaxation response. I lasted 11 seconds exactly. And I opened my eyes and said, I I'm so out of here. <laughs> I have to go now. I don't even know what I'm doing here. And poor Herb, you know, I'm still his most, most famous failure. Couldn't get me to do it. And it was only because, it was interesting, they, you know that Zen saying, when the uh, student is ready, the teacher appears. So... About five years ago, my uh, friend, Dr. Norman Rosenthal, with whom I had done studies at the National Institutes of Health, he was the he was psychiatrist who founded Seasonal Affective Disorder, was writing a new book. And he's always writing a book, you know, The Winter Blues, Seasonal Affective Disorder, you know, depression, I don't know, psychiatry stuff. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm an internist, so I kind of, you know. And so he called me, I'm doing another book. And I said, oh, God, what? Depression, anxiety, you know, it just seems like a hodgepodge out there. He says, no, it's called transcendence. I said, you've lost your mind. What? What, <laughs> what is that? And uh, he says, I don't know. I've been looking at the science of, of like meditation, and I specifically chose one form. That was transcendental meditation because it, it had all this hot science. I said, oh, God. And he said, Pam, you've got to scope it out. I said, look, you know, I flunked Harvard. We're not going to go with this. And he said, but you've got to take time. Time, are you out of your mind? I was living on a plane 
filming um, my Discovery show in Los Angeles. And it was just me and Virgin Airways. And that was it, my life. And so flash forward a year, he then sent me the galley of the book. By this time, it was written. And uh, he said, you know, can you just take a peek at it? And, you know, we're at a point now when we've written enough books, we just quote for each other. <laughs> it's like the little quote parade. And so I said, okay, fine, I'll read it. I couldn't put it down. I said, say what? There, you see, I'm a scientist. I needed to hear it. In, you can get a bigger brain. You can sharper vigilance. And, and this is, what do I sign up? This is pretty cool stuff. But then again, you know, I had my reservations. See, I don't do like, you know, holding hands, chanting. I don't do candles. I don't do any of this stuff. I had little issues. And I just come off, you know, a couple of big triathlons. And so I think I had hair on my chest at that time. I was, Arr, you know, like this. You know, do this weenie stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> I came into my teachers. And it was a husband and wife team. is Mario and, and Linda in Bethesda. And they were all ready for me because Norman apparently already called him and said, she's coming, <laughs> get ready. And I sat down and I said, now look, here are the rules, you know. I don't want some Oprah episode here. We're not going to do, you know, lighting candles and all the rest of it. And I don't want a new religion. I'm a recovering Catholic as it is. I don't need anything. I don't need any more problems. All I want is a bigger brain, this transcendence thing. Come on, let's do it. And so they sat down and they said, Dr. Pete, we have done due diligence on you. And we have figured out what you need. We've decided to call it warrior meditation. I said, yeah, let's do that, warrior meditation. And so with great trepidation, but yet there was something open in me. I sat down with Linda um, for my, my first session. And I'm telling you, have you ever just gone somewhere and you just luck out because you find the shoe that fits perfectly? I mean, I really, you know, she says, oh, yes, we'll be doing this for 20 minutes, sweat pouring down my face. What, 20? I couldn't even make it through 11 seconds. But it worked because it was literally that easy. It's incredibly easy. It wasn't, you have to think about a thought. You have to work. You have to do anything. And now, then I began to understand what they meant by this word transcendence. And what's interesting is, Using that, I wrote my next book, which was my third New York Times bestseller. The level of creativity and the level of openness, the ability to stay, you know, relatively speaking, calm and, and, and very funky and in very challenging situations became very, very evident. And suddenly I, I found more and more of my colleagues looking at this. I was just on stage with Ariana Huffington um, the, about a month and a half ago in New York. I'm talking about this very same thing, and she herself now is, is learning how to meditate um, because she's suddenly realizing, my God, the science is just too profound. This is too crazy. You know, why am I not using this at my level of, of expertise um, and work as an entrepreneur? So when I, when, I, when I really talk about this, I'm kind of like, I'm one of those, if I can do it, anybody can do it types. Because, you know, I didn't come with the robes and, you know, sandals. and stuff. I'm just, like, doing my thing here. But I'm a scientist. I read it. I get it. Okay? Make sense? Other questions? One thing that you mentioned earlier about green vegetables, that helps with the sugar thing. Just from personal experience, it's stabilized. You know, if you, want, you can cut down on sugar, but if you do a lot of the green vegetable stuff... Well, that's because of um, folate and the B vitamins. Um, they've been found to be very profoundly um, uh, effective in mood modulation. And, and this is one of the reasons why many people take it. And if you're B deficient, this also makes you impatient, impulsive, and irritable, the three eyes. And those three eyes are also taken care of by the prefrontal cortex. So all, you see how everything blends together, the epigenetics, the nutrition, the mental part. It's a, it's a very integrative approach. And the physical activity for stimulating more neurogenesis and, and supporting all of the rest of this sort of three pillars. Go for it. What, is there hope? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know it's been found to you know, be a... Uh, there is hope. You know what it, it is? It's the funniest thing. Um, when they started having more organic bars that were 70% cacao and more, 
that eliminated the problem for about 50% uh, of the people. Why? Because they got their chocolate, but it didn't have that e sweet taste to it, and it's not overly bitter. I wouldn't go above 80%. That's sort of like going to the, you know, the sawdust place. Um, but the 70% is phenomenal. And um, if you want to ever give that a whirl, that's fine. Um, because that's, one, it's got, the organic has tremendous flavonoids in it, great plant nutrients that are heart healthy and brain healthy. So you get a lot of that out of it, plus it just tastes good. Whole Foods got some really great ones. Um, Dragoba is one of them, for instance, and there's a whole bunch of other brands. But you have to taste test them. If you have a piece, and if you feel out of control, it ain't working for you. You have to say these words, that does not work for me. And just be honest with yourself. You know, when I talk to Dr. Volko, it's very funny. Um, she's become a connoisseur of the finest organic chocolate in the world. People just send it to her, I'm <laughs> saying droves. Christmas time, it's ugly over there at the NIH. Um, and she's got boxes of this stuff. And she just laughs. I mean, she's anemically thin. She's this big. She, and, and, but what she does is she does something very interesting. You want to hear a secret? Are we still rolling? Um, OK, so here's the secret. She runs seven miles a day. Not six, not eight, seven. It's a little compulsive. It's a lot compulsive, but you're happy because she's a scientist. She should be compulsive, all right? And what that does is it helps dampen her appetite, and it helps her feel like she's under you know, better control. And um, she, she has a very powerful prefrontal cortex. And, and she's very disciplined in that regard. So she just practices, practices. You have to find your own way around this. If it turns out it will never work for you, then that's fine. There is life without it, number one. But number two, most people are able to redefine their relationship with it. And if you find that you're only going to it when you're stressed out, stressed, by the way, spelled backwards, is desserts. Just think about that for a moment, OK? It's not arugula, it's stressed and desserts, okay? So um, if you find that you're only you know, going to chocolate when you're super stressed out, and, and, you're, and by the way, boredom is a form of stress. So a lot of people, oh, it's only when I'm bored. No, boredom is a form of stress. You don't want to be bored. You want to be engaged. I don't mean like you're running around like on a gerbil wheel. I just simply mean be engaged, listen to some music, you know, read a book, like that, but don't just sit there and stare. If you do that to an animal, they become self-destructive. <laughs> Try it. I have a German Shepherd. We, we can have a conversation, all right? So think about what's triggering that. If you're overeating it, why? Is it, it, you know, and maybe you just need a little vacation from it for a little bit and sort of look at your own patterns and then see whether or not. In my book, The Hunger Fix, I have a whole algorithm for this which really helps. It really, I'm not here to sell books. I'm just simply saying I killed myself to write the damn algorithm. So read it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because nothing had been written about this before. People were either abstinent or they were just like, you know, letting it rip with intuition. I don't know. It's, it's all OK. No, it's not all OK. We've got to be real here. Because a lot of these things aren't real foods. I wouldn't even grace them with the word food. It's just weird stuff. You know, that hits your bliss point. OK? There is hope. I know there is. Other question. Go, please. Um, so you mentioned the effects of refined sugars. What about things like high fructose corn syrup or other forms of sugar? The other forms of sugar do precisely the same thing, and especially with the, um, uh, these refined form. I mean, there's, good God, there are sugar alcohols. There are all kinds of level of, um, of sugar out there that are infused into your uh, foods. And you don't even recognize it because they're covered you know, by strange terminology um, in the ingredient labeling. You don't know unless you're a dietitian or, or a nutrition expert. So again, you, there's, a, there's a whole way of, of being able to discern what's going on on those labels. But here's another issue. Why are we eating something that's in a box in the first place? What happened to natural food? Just a thought. Something for you to mentally marinate. I'm not asking you to become Julia Child and you know, be whipping it up every moment, because we can't. We're all running around like crazy people. But there are some very simple ways to get whole foods. Very simple ways. 
And, and there's some great ways to curb your carb cravings. I'll give you one. A combination of protein and fiber. That's why protein smoothies work like a charm. One of those babies, you're good to go for two to three hours. I have recipes and food plans in, in the book that I'm actually utilizing. The reason why I'm bringing this up, very excited. I just flew up from Malibu where I'm working with um, the, a national group. It's the second largest addiction and eating disorders group in the country, and they're called Elements Behavioral Health. And I'm actually inaugurating the very first national program in food and addiction. And I've uh, hired very specific um, and very unique chefs who are what we call culinary nutritionists. These are registered dietitians who are also certified by the Culinary Institute of America as chefs. It's very unusual to find both in one human being. And what we've done is we've uh, tricked out all of the uh, foods that people who are coming out of addiction actually eat, because the transfer addiction is a nightmare. Oh, great, you're clean from alcohol and you just put on 75 pounds, now you're going to die of heart disease. So you're clean but unhealthy. This is not helping us. So I'm cleaning that up. And then we're also working with groups of women who have mental health disorders and mood disorders. And what we're doing is we're actually micro-manipulating um, uh, all of their nutrients, their macronutrients, um, and vitamins, et cetera, um, so that they can actually have improved mood um, and much better outcome from depression and anxiety. Um, and so this is the very first program of its kind where we're applying science. That's why I'm so excited about all this stuff. And it's all epigenetic. It's become a joke in the kitchen. It's like, where are the kale chips? These are real kale, kale chips, not that crap you buy at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, which are, look like little bagel chips or something, and covered with cheddar cheese. And They've adulterated it. Just take kale for crying out loud, slap it in the oven with some extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of sea salt, and we're home. It just tastes like you died and went to heaven. And you'll be sitting there at your dinner table or for a snack saying, I'm methylating. <laughs> I just can't stand it. I'm just, be quiet, I'm methylating. You know, it's just, it's, it's so cool, you know? So there you have it. Go ahead. What are your thoughts on stevia, either the powder or getting the plant and chopping it and putting it in the Very good. So the question is, what about the herbal stevia? Um, have you guys used stevia or, you know, uh, it, it's, it's in a lot of products now too as well. I think its brand name is Truvia and they have a couple of other companies out there too. So here's the gig with uh, stevia. Stevia is perfectly fine. I'll tell you why. You know Splenda is out there now. It's like in your sodas and, you know, the diet, fill in the blanks and all the rest of it. Okay, fine. So guess what we found um, about eight months ago? What we found was that um, the artificial sweeteners... Um, increase, remember how I told you the insulin, mind your insulin, because it's going all over the place and it's locking fat, you know, all the rest of it. Splenda does that. Now, aspartame, I'm not even going to address. That's just plain carcinogenic and anyone who's, who's drinking that, I mean, that's ridiculous. But Splenda's everywhere. Okay, so that's sucralose, right? Um, and so when you see that and you go, wow, I just had a diet fill in the blank and I just feel like I want to eat everything. Well, there's a reason why now, because you just jacked up your insulin. Now, stevia, what does it do? It has no effect on insulin, none. Why? It's an herbal. If it's an herbal, it's very close to our own biology and physiology. Therefore, it's not going to play with you like that. All of the artificial stuff will do that. So, you know, I, I, I'm a real huge fan of stevia. And the other thing I do is, you know, what's wrong with a nice big pitcher of water with sliced, you know, fruit in it? You know, or, or basically sort of fruit-infused water. Um, they have all of this great stuff out there, and I keep it everywhere. Always taking around my little Contigo, um, you know, container, no BPA, um, and all the rest of it. And, you know, if you're still thinking about drinking any of those sodas out there, um, you should also know that we just found out that, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi have just now um, removed yet another ingredient uh, from the citrus-looking uh, um, drinks. Um, this was Gatorade, Powerade, uh, Fanta, all of these. You know why? It had um, brominated vegetable oil. That's bromine as in flame retardant. So that's just, and by the way, it's still not out of there. They said, we're going to do it by the end of the year. 
Now, they took the stuff out of Gatorade a year ago. So Gatorade's good to go, not Powerade. So you got to be careful. That's what I'm saying. Water. Water. Teas. Fresh water. Just chop up 200 different fruits and just let them float in a bit, one of those big, beautiful, kind of glassy containers and just a little spigot and just keep it in your kitchen. Let it rip. That's what you really want to do all day long. Nothing better than that at all. Hydrate your beautiful bodies. Go for it. You mentioned that Now, there's a damn good question. And the question was, you have all these, like, it could be anyone, leaders in the world, it could be anyone, you know, titans of industry and, you know, all the rest of that. People have learned ways to be able to compensate for trauma. Some of them uh, have no idea that they had this kind of effect from childhood and adolescent trauma in their lives and it's left scars. And many of these people have great difficulty forming relationships, close relationships because of that. Trauma itself decreases trust in relationships, big time. When you, have, when you suffer an early betrayal, it's very difficult to, to get through that without some psychotherapy to help you understand what happened. So you, what you see is all kinds of ideations of, of navigating through that. Some people are just plain lucky. They figured it out innately and they said, you know, I'm gonna turn this lem lemons into lemonade. And I kind of see that this must have had a profound effect and they're a little bit more vigilant. But what I will tell you, which is very interesting, <laughs> people choose their professions for a reason. Many people in the military and law enforcement are hyper vigilant. They have to be constantly looking for the bad guy. Like this, right? It's in their DNA. And that also was fostered. Hyper vigilance is one of the direct effects of trauma because you see you can't trust, so you're constantly looking. And those people become superb at what they do, but forming relationships is very difficult. That's why, you know. Again, everyone kind of goes where they need to go. Most of them have not had any therapy. They just sort of, what we call in the business, muddle through. They're, the smart ones learn to avoid situations that ignite something ugly in them. And if they're lucky, if they're, and many of them are, they surround themselves both domestically and professionally with people who will protect them from themselves. You see this all the time. But that's a very good question. Other questions? I'm having way too much fun. Go. How about honey? Is it similar to other refined sugars? Honey, raw honey is the best way to do it. Raw honey. So, you know, we could score this almost everywhere. But raw honey is definitely the best way to do it. But I, again, using it parsimoniously. You know, I use a little bit of my tea here and there and everywhere. It's just fun. You know, it just works. Again, it's how much you use, how much you expose. And the grand majority of people have no problem with that, so long as you're not pouring in, you know, jars of this stuff. But in this society, that's what people do. It's just crazy out there. It's like totally out of control. But that's perfectly fine. So is maple syrup. And this is the natural maple syrup, right? But so long as it doesn't look white. The joke is, um, if it's white, it's not right. <laughs> because what does it mean? I mean, it's sort of an interesting word, a contradiction in terms. It's refined. No, it's manufactured and processed. You took something perfectly fine, like cane sugar, which is dark, and you stripped it of every nutrient it had until you had empty calories. You had a teaspoon, 50 calories of emptiness. That's all you got, and a jacked-up insulin, which locked up your fat cells. 
sign me up. You know, it's like, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. So just keep that in mind. Yes, go ahead. Perfectly fine. That one you could see in a lot of those gums, for instance. I think at Whole Foods they have, I forgot the name of the brand and stuff, but you'll see that in some of the gums and that's fine. Not a problem. Um, go ahead. Just talk a little bit about music, because my personal experience is that I've been doing TM for several months, and just like a several weeks ago, I stopped liking me. I just don't like to eat me. God was with you. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, look, let's go paleo for a moment, okay? Um, a long time ago, when we, we had, like, real meat, like, we had deer running through the forest, and they were almost all muscle, very little fat, um, and we, we did that for our sort. That's perfectly fine. Once again, we have science fair projects. I, I can't believe they have another recall on beef again. You know, it's killing people with E. coli, and, and Lord knows, back and forth. I heard it on the news last night. It's rolled my eyes. Um, so part of our problem is the source of the meat. It's not natural, or you're paying through the nose for it, and can you really trust them when they say it's natural? You know, hmm, you know. The other issue is how is it being prepared? Okay, how is it being prepared? And the grand majority of red meat, as it courses through, you know, your intestines, you can look it up, just Google it. Um, basically, the, the breakdown products are nitrosamines. And nitrosamines are highly carcinogenic. So people who have the highest level of that going on, and especially with the science fair projects we're eating, this wasn't caveman a million years ago, um, are the people who have the highest levels of colonic cancer. So we got a problem, right? It's a problem. It's the source of the stuff, how it's prepared, you know? Um, so, you know, people go through their own little evolutions here, and you're going through yours. I'm, I'm just one of those people who, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of one of these reasonable people. I'm like a Madeleine Albright. Everyone just sit down, relax. Let's all talk to each other here. I'm not an extremist. I'm not riotous. I'm like, I'm a scientist, right? So if you want an occasional red meat, I, I don't know anybody died, right? Um, I personally don't just because that's my choice. I haven't had it in I can't tell you how many years because I was a smarty pants. I read this stuff a long time ago. Right? Um, the same thing goes, quite frankly, with poultry. And yeah, that's another little tricky one. Fish is another one. There's like three fish on the planet we can now eat that won't kill us. I mean, it just, but yet I have fish. You know, I, I'll have that as a source of protein. But I find myself more and more vegetarian just because it's just, it, it, I can control it. I can control a lot of that, a lot better. It's a matter of control for me. You know, if I grow my own beans or if I grow my own strawberry, I kind of know where it came from. You know, and I try to do the best I can with that. So a lot of it's just sitting down and being with yourself and saying, what feels good? What's working for me here? You know? And really, I'm going to tell you something. You don't need that much food. You don't. Is that a little shocker? <laughs> you don't need that much food. Why do we have Mount St. food for every single meal? You don't need that much. It's, it's sort of amazing. And the older you get, the less you actually need. Even at the athletic level, our bodies are just so amazingly efficient. We just don't need that much. A, a beautiful thing to do is to actually read this great book called The Blue Zones. And this was about um, the places on this planet where the 100-year-olds hang out. Okinawa is one of them. And in almost, it's the weirdest thing. In almost every single one of those cultures, what they do um, is they say something um, in concert with their meals, almost like a little blessing or a saying or something. And the Okinawans, I'm not going to say it in Japanese because I'll butcher it to death, but it basically means um, stop before full. It means that what you're doing is you're very mindful and conscious of what you're doing and you're allowing your body to feel satisfied instead of doing what we do, which is wolfing it down in three seconds and never even allowing the hormones in the gut to make contact with the brain to say, yo, you're full. You supervene over that and then the whole thing goes to hell. So just taking a moment and savoring and enjoying is really where it's at. And when you do that, 
You eat less. Now, if you think I'm just full of it, do this. Do a meditation meal, a quiet meal. Don't say a word, have everything all teed up, and just thoroughly enjoy it. No distractions, nothing, but make it a beautiful ambiance, you know, crackling fire and, you know, the whole thing, a little music. All that's cool. And then just eat. Watch what happens. I did this once, damn near killed me since I couldn't talk, but... Um, there, that you weren't supposed to laugh. See, you were supposed to go, what? I'm so surprised. Um, and so I went through this, and I, as a scientist, I could never turn it off. I was observing everyone around me. I was doing this at Rancho La Puerta, which is this beautiful spa on the other side of the border. And um, it was beautiful. It was a winter evening, just beautiful ambiance, little music, crackling fight, the whole thing. And I watched, there were about 50 people in there. They're all adults and, you know, just doing their thing. And this is what I observed. The first thing was not a single person finished their plate. Not one. And they had just normal portions. Not one. Two, that they all felt full. I mean, when I say full, I satisfied much sooner. They, they, they were thoroughly enjoying putting down the fork listening to the music, getting into, when's the last time you did that? How about never? Because you're distracted, right? You're distracted. You don't even know what you're doing. We have no idea what we're doing when we're eating now. So you eat less, you enjoy more, and your body adapts over time. That's what happens. It's pretty cool stuff. And there was someone raising their little hand. Did I get you all? Oh, it well, was you. I was, I was going to ask a sort of vegan diet versus paleo diet, and you kind of answered it, but maybe if you could go into that. Vegans, vegans um, takes it to the next level. Um, you have to be careful with the vegan because of the, the B12 issue, because you're not going to get sources for B12. The other thing with vegan is that it's, it's very hard to negotiate when you're out a lot, when you travel a lot, and back and forth. So it tends to be a problem. Is it possible? Of course it is. Tons of people are. Um, you know, our pal uh, Clinton is, former president. He has to be um, because he has severe heart disease. And so he has to go to the extreme place. And he also has people to cook for him and make it all good and back and forth. But, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with vegan at all. If you want to go vegan, that's perfectly fine. It's just that you have to be extremely strategic about making certain that you're getting all of your vitamins and that you're getting enough protein. Sometimes it's hard to get as much protein. Protein's a big problem with the vegan thing because you, you don't have other sources of protein that even vegetarians have, you know, lacto-ovo and all the rest of it. And so protein's an issue. The B vitamins are an issue, right? But it's perfectly fine otherwise. Oh, the gluten thing. Okay. Um, People who really feel like they have an issue with gluten should be checked out by a real doctor and a real test. The grant, a new study just came out, and it literally just came out in the last 48 hours. And this was a study of people who swore on a stack of Bibles that they were gluten, you know, sensitive. And as it turns out, um, only 14% were. And yet, you know, I mean, they had the symptomatology, which is really funky symptomatology. I mean, you are really in pain, and it is a, not a good situation. This isn't just like, oh, I feel a little funky. No, this is like you're in pain, right? Because it's a gross inflammatory process within the uh, GI tract, and it hurts. So, and those people had not yet even been checked out by a physician, but all the rest of them didn't have anything at all. They just felt like they did. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm gluten-free, and then, you know, suddenly they're sanctimonious, and all is well, and they'll be thin as a rail in no time, only to find out they just packed on an extra five. Because gluten-free foods are just as fattening as the next thing. So th there's no magic to that whatsoever. If, however... You're looking just simply at grains per se, and you're trying to avoid processed grains, then I'm all over it. 
okay, who needs processed grains? Because if you have processed grains, you're going to be playing with your insulin exactly the same way as I said to you before. It's nothing more than easily digestible carbohydrate with a high glycemic index. That's what the processed manufactured grains are. Quinoa is fine. Barley is fine. Oats are fine. All right? And then if you have a true multigrain, it's fine. But if you buy, you know, like uh, some whole wheat, quote, quote, um, bread over at uh, Safeway or whatever you got out here, then run the opposite direction because that's just nothing but manufactured junk and you don't want to touch that. So who needs to have to go gluten-free, you know, running around like crazy people when all you got to do is just avoid the manufactured stuff? Oh, hell, make your own. Seriously. You got bread makers, you can do your own little thing. And then you're in full control of everything, every ingredient that goes into it. You know, I think what we're doing is we're actually coming full circle now and saying, you know, cooking wasn't so bad. <laughs> we kind of ran away from cooking and all of that and we went to the boxes and the bags. And now we're coming full circle saying, cooking, not so bad because we're in control and we, we can do the sensual experience of holding food and honoring it and, and, you know, asking for that blessing over the food saying, thank you for giving me nourishment. I love that. That's cool stuff. Works for me. Go. Uh, no alcohol at all or non-addictive chewing with uh, enjoyment or control uh, alcohol. Oh, alcohol is fine. Are you kidding me? No, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an idiot, no. <laughs> Coffee, great. Um, actually, um, we, we first started looking at all this when we started examining centenarians and um, octogenarians and others. Um, and this is the great work done by Tom Pearls at Harvard and, um, and his, uh, his colleague Silver. And uh, this was also um, a piece of what we saw with the Nun study as well that came out just about the same time, University of Kentucky. This is what we found. There's nothing wrong with having a little alcohol here. Notice I said a little alcohol um, here, there, and everywhere. They had their little sherry before they went to bed at nighttime and, you know, back and forth and up and down. But, you know, it, it was thoroughly enjoyed. It was enjoyed. We go back to that enjoy thing. And, and they, they really did it extremely well. Um, and the coffee is the same thing. You know, they had a cup of coffee. They did not have a venti, macchiato, hoo-ha, nasty thing. They had a cup of, do you know what normal cups of coffee look like? Hint, they don't come like this, you know. What they do is, they, they, if you have a little cup with a saucer, that's what it's supposed to look like, okay? That's a cup of coffee. Not this. We, we just, we, we forgot that. So as it turns out, the centenarian studies actually showed that the grand majority of these people had a varied diet. You know, they still had a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, uh, it, it really spanned the full spectrum, but they had smaller portions. They were much more physically active and they were very mentally engaged. And, and they were interconnected with their communities. And so with all of those together, it wasn't just diet alone. All of those together, you had someone who had high quality longevity. That was the issue. Did you know that having friends and, and regularly staying in touch with these friends was equal to, if not more powerful in terms of longevity, high quality life than physical activity? No one knew that until they started following the bingo players and the people who are doing mahjong and, you know, all the rest of them. Everyone wrote them off like, you know, a bunch of silly little people. Really? And then how come they're 100 and you're not? Um, and so they started studying this. They said, oh, my God. So the ones who were alone were the ones who died earlier because they didn't have the support system. But just that marvelous oxytocin-rich environment of bonding this is another reason why women live longer than men. Men tend to be much more solo. Women are like bonding with, you know, walls and everything. I mean, we just bond. We just bond. Bonding with the screen. You know, we just bond. It's sort of in our DNA. 
Um, obviously, I'm being facetious. Some women don't, but whatever. Um, but the, the, the issue is it's, it's a sort of a beautiful multi-layered package that helps us with that. And it includes alcohol. It does. Yes. And I'm sorry. Oh, are you saying fermented? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said permanent foods. Oh, what the hell is a permanent? Food? Miss the, I missed that chapter. Yeah, fermented foods are fine. I mean, you know, they're they're a piece of the action. And um, again, natural sources make certain that in the best of all worlds, a lot of people ferment their own stuff. You know, and that's once again keeps it all within the same confines um, of natural. But I have no problems with that whatsoever. I mean, they're supposed to be good for you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, taking that question one step further, how about um, just extracting juices from the nutrients, the juices from the. Juice? How many of you juice? You like to juice? Yeah, juicing's cool. That's no problem. Just, just be careful of the following. One. Um, Fiber is very important. So if you juice, hold on to that fiber, you know, in the back and do something with it. Have fun. All right? Put it in your cooking. Make sure you don't lose the fiber. Number two, what are you juicing? Okay? If you're juicing kale, cucumber, and celery, that's one thing. It's got, like, zip for, you know, glucose in it. But if you're throwing in tons of carrots, apples, you know, fruit, and all the rest of it, suddenly we're back to a boatload of, you know, like a load of, of glucose, you got to be careful about that. So what I love to do is really be more veg heavy, right? And uh, maybe throw in a carrot so that you don't have a boatload. I mean, nothing wrong with carrots per se, but it's people kind of overdo it. Um, and because this tends to be a little bit higher glycemic index. But uh, the thing, if you have a little juice here, there, and everywhere, that's fine. That's fine. But the Mac Daddy is whole food, because then you get the whole package. I, I don't know if you know this, but th and this is another new piece of hot information. Fiber, they have just found out that fiber actually affects the brain to control appetite. So the more fiber you have in your diet, meaning a minimum of 40 grams a day, the more fiber in your diet, the more you can control appetite. Now, isn't that just the coolest? The other piece that you should also know, and this just came out of this um, wonderful work by uh, Ludwig over at, um, uh, at Harvard. If you have two different kinds of dietary intake, one being lower carbohydrate, when I say that, it's like 30 to 40% of your diet, all the rest of it, half and half, protein and, and fat, because you want healthy fats, avocados, nuts, et cetera. Um, and you want healthy um, protein from a variety of sources. All right, so if you have a lower carbohydrate group compared to a group that's lower fat, this was the biggest mistake ever made by, and I quote, the diet industry, unless it wasn't a mistake and was a horrible conspiracy. I'm not going to go there. But um, if you compare them, if they're eating exactly the same number of calories doing the same level of moderate physical activity. The group that has the lower carbohydrate intake, and when I say lower carbohydrate, they're not eating refined sugars. That carbohydrate is mostly vegetables, some fruits, and some appropriate grains. Okay, so that's where they're getting it from. Then the group that is having the lower carbohydrate is on a routine basis burning 325 more calories per day, just rocking and rolling through the day, than the group that's low fat. Why? Didn't I just explain this to you? And that's right. Those fat cells in the low fat group are on lockdown because you have a higher amount of carbohydrate coming through the system. So talk about something that's the easiest way to drop a few here if you, have, if you want to shed excess body fat. You just simply hit it with healthy carbs at about 30 to 40 percent and, and just avoid these, these uh, refined manufactured carbs. And you've got yourself a winning, an extra 325 a day. That's equal to an hour's worth of moderate physical activity. 
and you didn't even have to do that. And then if you added moderate physical activity or a little bit more every day, you get even more of a you know, bang for your buck. So that's why what you eat means everything. And by the way, the old adage, a calorie is a calorie, is now officially dead. Do you trust organic food? Do I trust it? That's a very good question. <laughs> well, that, that's a loaded one because it depends upon how you define organic. And that is the trick. We have the federal level, we have the private level, we have probably at least 10 different definitions of organic. Um, so what, the way I look at it is an order of magnitude, right? So it just depends upon, you know, if you go to Whole Foods and it says organic, are you trusting them? You have to look at their policies and how they define it. And let me tell you, by the time you drill it down, it's not pretty. As it turns out, it's not that much different. And the only difference we found, it was actually, it was a Stanford study. <laughs> it was, I swear. It was a Stanford study. And what they found was that the only main difference between organic and non-organic was the level of pesticide. That's really what it was. It just drilled right down to it. It's a level of pesticide. Um, and look, I mean, between you, me, and the walls, the Stanford walls here, um, there's probably not an acre of arable land left in the United States that's not tainted. It's only an order of magnitude. So which one's tainted worst? Okay? I mean, it, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? I said arable land. I didn't say the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I just said arable land. So, I mean, we have to just get realistic about what's happened to our environment. We do. Insoluble is wonderful. Whips right through. Keeps that GI tract in, in marvelous shape. And it also allows you to do one thing. It, it gums up the system, as it were, um, so that whatever you're eating, that is carbohydrate. Let's just say I had some sweet potato right now or zucchini, right? So I'm extracting all that wonderful carbohydrate, but it takes longer because the fiber's in the way. So it's great. So you're aiming for 40 to 50 grams of fiber. And, and you just look at what you're eating and just get that fiber in there one way or the other. Fiber is good. Keeps that GI system nice and healthy. Questions? Have I exhausted you? What? How about a couple tablespoons of that psyllium powder? That's fine. That's perfectly fine. I mean, you know, that'll do the same thing. If you really couldn't find the, uh, the fiber otherwise, that's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. It also gives you a sense of fullness. A lot of people are using that now, you know, to be able to help them reduce appetite a bit when it looks like it's, you know, running out of control as it's wont to do in this lovely society. Look, guys, it's a battlefield out there. <laughs> Got to arm ourselves for war. It's hysterical. I just, when you go out there, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. And it's very, this is why having an optimal prefrontal cortex is absolutely imperative. I mean, it's, I'm not kidding you. I gave this, um, I gave a TED talk, another one, where I actually had this picture of something I had taken at the, at Chicago, um, at the, at the uh, O'Scare Airport. Um, as I went up there, and I was walking along, of course, there was another delay or, you know, whatever, and, um, and as I was walking along, there was this sign, it was really weird, it was like a placard sign, and it said, come closer, I was like, hmm, that's creepy, so I said, come closer, of course I did, and it, and it said, can you smell it, can you just taste it, it's waiting for you, I thought, this is like pornographic. I mean, what are we doing here? So, of course, I was interested in all these people behind me. We're all doing the same thing. We're following along like little sheep, sheeple. And uh, so we just kept going around the corner. There's another sign. You're almost there. It's waiting for you. Can you smell it? And I thought, what is 
is this? Bath, Bath and Beyond or, you know, one of these places with aromatherapy. And I, as I came around, it was a Starbucks. <laughs> it was very sharp. You know, of course, by the time I got there, there was not a pastry left. They were all gone, every scone. I mean, they just, you know, they took your psyche and they just hijacked that reward center, queued you up and dropped you to the curb. It was, I was so shocked, I couldn't even believe it. So, I mean, everywhere we go, there are cues and triggers. The stronger your prefrontal cortex, the easier it is to stay on track. Because then you just go out there and say, I'm not an idiot. I'm not getting into that stuff. And then be smart and strategic. Never, ever, ever put yourself in a position where you're super starving to death or you're sleep deprived, right? Or you're angry and really upset. Then you become not angry, you become hangry. A little hunger and that anger together. And then you're going to eat everything that's not tacked down. Um, and so you got to really be on, this is why being centered and, and really on a daily basis, coming back for that checking in on yourself is so incredibly powerful, especially today. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.